Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me on the Staining 101 webinar here. Normally we do these live. Today it's a little bit different. I had a uh, obligation I had to meet, so I'm doing this one pre-recorded. We're talking all about bidding fence staining jobs. So we do a lot of different series on fence staining, deck staining, wood restoration, the whole industry as a whole. And uh, today we're just going to take one little bite-sized piece out of uh, and talk about bidding fence staining jobs. So just like always, if this is the first time you watch one of our webinars, I just want to tell you a little bit about the stain and seal industry. So if you're thinking about joining the industry, getting in, maybe adding it to your fencing business, maybe adding this to your deck install business, or maybe you're just, you know, maybe you're just wanting to become an entrepreneur and, and start doing some weekend work and maybe start your own business, uh, you can do it. And so the industry, uh, let's talk about it. How big is the industry? Um, so the industry the global wood coatings market was valued at $7.8 billion in 2018, and it was projected to reach around $12 billion by 2025, according to Allied Market Research. But I think with the, high, the, you know, the rising cost of lumber, the way things are, the inflation we've seen, I think that by 2025, we will probably be in a 15, maybe 25 billion, 15, 20, 25 billion dollar uh, wood coatings industry, which is bigger than the fencing industry. It's bigger than the power washing industry. It's, it's a big one. So the pie is a big pie and there's plenty of seats at the table for everybody. And I like to tell everybody that so that they don't get so worried about being so super competitive that they, they race to the bottom and, and just, they ruin their markets wherever that is that they are. So just keep that in mind. It's a big pie. Um, just because a new guy comes to town doesn't mean you're going to make less money. So, uh, or just, and just maybe if you're in a, a highly developed market, doesn't mean that you can't come in uh, and break through and be the new kid on the block. So um, keep that in mind. Highly developed markets like Dallas, Fort Worth have generally gone, grown complacent um, and a new kid on the block could really make their mark in a big competitive marketplace. Uh, we see it all the time. We see uh, like in Nashville, a heat and air company will come in and in three years, they've got a huge foothold in the marketplace. Uh, when when somebody else maybe just saw as much competition and they didn't do it. So don't be that guy. So the what can we stain and seal? And uh, let's talk about that for a minute. So there's many opportunities, and these are the most common. Fencing and decking, we all think of that. Um, old fence and deck restoration, you know, which is a big thing, especially with this lumber shortage that we have going on. We can do pergolas, patio covers, uh, gazebos, shutters, Boat docks, railings, you can do pre-finishing, pre-staining, things like that. Those are all opportunities that are available um, in the trade of stain and sealing. And so how do you begin? I tell most guys that there's three ways to get started in a st in to be staining, add staining to your business or become a stain contractor. Number one is if you've got an established business, such as a fence company, a deck company, a power wash company, a paint company, and you don't want to stain, but maybe you want to Maybe you, you still want to offer that service to your customers. You can refer a contractor. Um, by referring a contractor, you may not make any money, but your fence jobs, your deck jobs, your wash jobs are going to look better than anybody else's. They're going to be less likely to warp if you're building uh, wood structures and you'll be giving more value to your client base. So if you can give your client base a really solid referral for a contractor that's going to come in and really take care of them, they're going to be served better. They're going to appreciate it. And they're going to remember you at the end of the day. And you're going to have less warranty work. You're going to have less issues down the road. And then when somebody drives through a neighborhood and they see all these gray fences with a fence sign on there, and then they see your fence with your sign on, but it's been stained and sealed, you're going to be at the top of their list of who to call. So it's a great thing to do. The second way you can do this is you can hire a subcontractor. A good subcontractor can be a great thing. It will add revenue to your business without really adding any overhead to your current operation. Um, so we've got a Facebook group. If you're not a member, you should join. Um, it's called Staining University. It's a Facebook group with about 31, 3,200 members as of right now, um, July 2021. And I guarantee you there's somebody in there. There's probably multiple guys in your market there right now who would love to uh, get you into your staining jobs for you. So keep that in mind. That's a great one. Oh, phone's ringing. You need to turn that to airplane mode. 
All right, guys. So the third way you can do it is to start your own crew. You can start from scratch or offer new services to your client, you know, your current client base. So if you're already business and current customers, like you're a fence contractor or power washer, you already have these customers. So adding the service on would be just as easy as getting a little bit of equipment and getting a little bit of practice, maybe on your fence or your neighbor's fence or your grandma's fence. Great way to get started. Um, and uh, also we offer these standing university in-person live events that are always free. That's a great way to get started too. And if you're watching this in July, you should know that we've got events coming up in Richmond, Virginia in August. We've got events coming up in Springfield, Missouri, Dallas, Texas, uh, later in the year, probably Houston, Texas. And then we got a big one. Uh, the, the big main event is in Nashville every year. This year, it's going to be the 24th, 25th, and 26th uh, in Nashville in February, 24th, 25th, and 26th in February. And then I think in March, we got one going on in Pennsylvania. So they're, they're spread out all over. There's no excuse not to make it to these events. Um, it's going to be filled with great information. But let's get started on our topic of discussion today. So fence bidding jobs, bidding fence jobs. Uh, bidding, staining, whatever you want to call it, this is what we're going to do. And it's really a quite a simple process. Um, I don't want to make it complicated because it's not. Um, so we'll get started. Um, and all our pricing, just just I want to say up front, all our pricing is not the pricing that I'm telling you to charge. This is not the pricing that we charge. This is the price that we have through market research have, have seen that these are ranges. Um, uh, these are ranges that we see things going through. And um, so it's just a good indicator of what you can charge um, for stain jobs. Um, and it's a good indicator of what the market is doing for stain jobs. So keep that in mind. So bidding fencing by the square foot, unless you are a fence installer or you're working with a fence contractor. Uh, number one, you gotta speak the right language. So 200 feet, so, let me, let me talk about that for a minute. So if you're dealing with a fence contractor or you yourself are a fence contractor, then you generally live in the world of linear feet. Everything that you're doing is by a linear foot and you need to know that language. If you're a paint contractor or a power wash contractor or you're working with one of those guys, they are generally in the square footage world because they're already bidding everything that they do by the square foot. So you may want to adjust your language who you're talking to based on who you're talking to. If it's, um, you know, if you're, you know, it's not uncommon for us here to be pick up one phone and be talking to a fence contractor and say, yep, we'll do it for you for whatever per, per linear foot. And then the phone rings again and we get a power wash guy or somebody coming in um, and we would tell them, Hey, it's going to be many, uh, cents or whatever per square foot. So hope that helps. Uh, make sure you speak the right language. So let's do some examples here. Um, 200 feet of six foot privacy fence is, and the way you figure this out, um, we're going to talk about square footage right now, is 200 feet times 12, which would be a six foot tall fence doing both sides of the fence. So 200 times 12 equals 2,400 square feet. And in parentheses there, I said, it includes both sides. You never ever wanna double the linear footage because it causes confusion. Uh, a lot of times guys will call me and they'll say, well, how much stain do I need for 400 feet of fence or 900 feet of fence or whatever, 400 feet of fence. And I'll, I'll tell them, um, what are you doing both sides? And they'll say, well, that is both sides. And, and I'll say, what do you mean? And they say, well, it's 200 feet, but we're doing both sides. So it's 400 feet. And I'll say, wait a minute, you're going to confuse, you're confusing me. Um, and I know you're confusing your customer too. So if they have 200 feet of fence, just make it really simple and say, it's 200 feet of fence and we're going to stay in both sides, or it's 200 feet of fence and we're only going to stain one side. And that makes it real simple, um, real simple, keeps the confusion down. And uh, you never have to worry about accidentally ordering too much stain or accidentally ordering not enough or overbidding or underbidding on your price. Um, as it, where it really gets weird if you do that is if you're, if you're calling, like if you are working with a subcontractor or your crews and you tell them, hey, it's 400 feet and maybe you forget to tell them that that means both sides or whatever. And these guys are going to show up with too much manpower or maybe not enough manpower. So uh, just keep that in mind. Good, good practices. Um, so stain price, 
let's go with uh, so so stain price. Fifty cents per square foot is the same as six dollars per linear foot, and so that comes back to knowing your numbers. You really need to know your numbers so you can quickly and on the fly say um, fifty cents a foot. We're going to do it for you, and then the, the next guy you can tell him six dollars a linear foot. And it's the same number, it's the same price, but we're just talking to two different people. So know your numbers and know the right language to speak uh, based on what contractor you're talking to. Hope all that makes sense for you guys. So bidding fences. So let's talk about bidding fences. Um, 200 foot, that, that same 200 foot fence, six foot privacy is 2,400 square feet. It's going to use about 20 gallons of stain and sealer. And the way I figured that was the average um, for semi-transparent stains, the average for transparent stains, generally the guys that are applying these coatings professionally are going anywhere from 115 to about 135 square feet per gallon um, with the average being right at 125, right on the nose. So we know that if we, if we figure this at 125 square, square feet a gallon, our math is gonna be really good and we're gonna order enough stain. Um, so 200 feet times 12, again, equals 2,400 square feet. And if we divide that 2,400 by 125 square feet per gallon, it gives us 19.2 gallons of stain. And before I go into what that's going to cost, I want to talk about the math a little bit. Here's a really quick way to figure your stain usage on six foot standard privacy fences. Um, you drop the zero. So if it's 200 feet of fence, we need 20 gallons of stain. If it's 300 feet of fence, we need 30 gallons. If it's 50 feet of fence, we need five gallons. If it's 330,000 feet of fence, then we only need 33,000 gallons of stain. The numbers work really simple and it, it's, it, it's linear. So this thing works no matter how far you go with it and it, it stays right on the nose. So it's a really, really easy math. If somebody calls you up and they say, hey, I've got 337 feet of fence I need to do. Um, and we're going to use um, a sprayer with a 300 foot hose. Um, I'm going to know 330 feet. It's going to use 33 gallons of stain. They've got 300 feet of hose, which I'll get into in a minute. It's going to use three gallons of stain. So he actually needs 36 gallons of stain for this job. So you need to order eight buckets because it's going to take 40 gallons to get the job done. And you're going to have uh, you're going to have uh, what's a couple gallons left over. So. But back to the cost, that 19.2 gallons of stain will be four buckets of stain. And most guys are paying somewhere in the range of $597 for that if they buy it in state at a store and pay tax for it. And again, a quick note, don't forget to add one gallon per 100 feet of sprayer hose. Um, this gets a lot of guys in trouble and you need to know it. Nobody else is telling you this. So make a note of this because I can't tell you how many guys they bought big sprayers, um, spent a ton of money, and they got 300 feet of hose, and they go to the first job, and they only have enough stain to do um, all of the fence except the last five panels. Man, you talk about mad. Um, it's not a good way to start out your stain career. So just make sure you add in a foot, uh, a gallon per 100 feet of hose. Real simple. 300 foot hose equals three extra gallons of stain that's going to be in your line that you cannot get to without pushing it out uh, with another color or something else. So a um, little pro tip there. Um, labor on that 200 foot fence would be roughly three to four man hours. Um, you can do it faster. A lot of our guys would do that same 200 foot fence in one to two man hours. So three to four man hours is a good conservative number. And if you're paying 25 bucks an hour in labor, uh, either to yourself or to your crews, um, it's gonna be about hundred dollars in labor. So the cost of goods sold, you're going to hear me talking about this more at the end of this chapter, cost of goods sold for this project is $697. So where, how am I going to get my number for this? Um, cost of goods sold, 697 times two equals a 50% margin or $1,394. So the cost for me to create this job and get it done is 697 and our gross profit would be double that. So there would be another $697 there for gross profit to cover uh, the things that we need to cover. So what does that math look like? That 2,400 square feet times 58 cents equals 1394. So we know that the market 
uh, for the average guy is going to be somewhere around 58 cents a square foot um, for a 50, if they're going for a 50% gross profit margin. And I do recommend that you go with a 50% margin because um, lower margins, just businesses tend to struggle when they go with anything lower than that. They just can't get enough oxygen, can't get their head above water. So 50% is that magic number across pretty much all of the trades. Gross profit margin covers overhead and net profit. So before profit is made, the overhead must be paid. Overhead is rent, lease payments, insurance, fuel, taxes, repairs, maintenance, new equipment, et cetera, insurances for your people, um, things, things of that nature. When all of this is paid, you're left with the net profit. So $697 gross profit in four man hours is not a bad thing. Um, I encourage you to look at what you're currently doing, whether it be fence building, power washing, whatever that is, and see how it compares to what you're currently doing. And I think you'll be, um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So some of the things you want to look for, well, before I move on, let's talk about what we just covered. This math that I just showed you will pretty much cover you all the way through. Um, if you do man hours, um, and you know, maybe you've got an obstacle. Um, for instance, let's say that there is a swimming pool in the backyard of this 200 foot job. You might determine that it's going to take another one to two man hours to cover that swimming pool up. And it's going to take, uh, let's say it uses $20 worth of masking material to do that. So we've added another 50, 60, $70 onto our job. So you could add 140, which would be a 50% margin on that, an additional $140 to that job to cover that. And what you're going to find is going by man hours is really a good way to do it. You can also quote jobs by the, just, just have you a square foot number and keep your things updated constantly, keep an eye on it. And that works too. And it'll get you really close. But uh, there's nothing better than breaking each job down individually. But I understand time is of the essence. And in our company, we know our numbers and we're constantly updating them, but we go by the square foot. And so we can bid jobs quickly because we don't have time to break every job down. But we know our numbers and we know where they need to be. And we're doing essentially this formula on every project we do without having to break everything down. Um, and, and our man hours are good. We know exactly where those things need to be. So things to look for when you're bidding fence jobs. Um, some of the things that stand out that, that are going to be things that you just maybe, um, maybe you are, are going to take you more time. Maybe they're going to be uh, add a degree of difficulty to the job. Um, I'm going to point some of those out. One, is there restoration work needed? Is this fence dirty? Does it need cleaned? Does it need stained? Does it have stains? on it from organic growth, or maybe the lawn guy put some kind of iron treatment for the grass and it stained the fence a funky color. Um, what do we need to do to get this fence prepped and ready to stain? Ideally, we love to stain brand new fences because we're in and out and it's super easy. Um, but the, the fact is there's a lot of restoration work that needs to be done. With lumber shortages, there's a lot more people spending money to have their old fence renewed. And so it's something you need to know how to do and there's another webinar that you can watch um, that will give you the information on that. So we'll cover that in another webinar, which has already been done. So extra masking, do we, need, do we have swimming pools? Do we have neighbors' fences close by? Are there 14 cars uh, in a parking garage next door? Um, is, is the house a hardy plank siding house? Hardy board needs masked. It is, you can't do the water trick like a lot of guys do on brick homes where they wet the brick down and then they stain. You can't do that on hardy plank. It'll get you in trouble. So you get a mask. Do they have exotic landscaping? Do they have the, the plant that only blooms once every 30 years at midnight uh, right next to the fence? Kind of like uh, in Dennis the Menace, if any of you guys remember that. You don't want to mess that plant up by masking it wrong or by getting stain on it or some kind of wood cleaning chemical. So you just need to know and ask those questions. Any Japanese maple trees, any exotic landscaping that we need to know about next to the fence uh, because you would wanna add on some prep fees for that. 
And again, lots of exposures would be cars, pools, neighbors' houses, um, you know, just anything that could that could be something you would be constantly keeping your eyes on while you're out there on that staying job, something that might make you nervous. What we learned a long time ago was, was just charge for it. If they've got a Lamborghini, they don't mind paying you extra money to mask the Lamborghini. Um, you know, some people just, they're not going to move the car. And sometimes you got to charge them to cover it. Um, and then confined space staining. This is one that we get sometimes. There's some spaces you can't get between. And then there's some spaces that you can get between, but it's a pain in the butt. Um, charge for that. That's added man hours. That's stress on your guys. The worst thing that you can do is um, give your guys jobs that have really tight cores to get in and you force them in there and, and you don't give them any extra time to do it. You just you just throw it at them and you do it all the time because you're bidding them too cheap because everybody else is charging more for those. What you'll end up doing is you'll get a lot of jobs, but you're going to wear your guys down. You're going to wear them out and they're just not going to like it. So take care of your people by charging accordingly for confined space staining. So um, there you go. Let's talk about profit margin for a minute. You must know your numbers and your numbers should be based on what it will cost you to produce a job. So everybody's always asking in these Facebook groups on the forums and, and when they call us here in our office, how much should I charge? Um, well, what does it cost you to do the job? You know, if you don't know that number, then I can't tell you what you should charge. Um, my, my numbers are going to be different than your numbers and everybody's numbers are going to be different. Even two, two similar companies in the same town doing the same job, their numbers are going to be different because their, their cost of goods sold is different. Their labor is different. Um, you know, that's the way it is. Maybe their material cost is slightly different. So keep that in mind. You need to learn your numbers so you can bid these things properly. Um, a step further is that you must pay yourself a fair wage for the job being done if you're an owner operator. So a lot of guys decide that well, I'm just going to figure my stain cost and I'm not going to pay myself anything. I'm, I'm not going to figure that. Well, you can do that for a little while, but you're never going to be able to scale your business at those margins because what's going to happen is there's no money there to pay anyone. And if you want to bring on more people because you're getting more work, you're not going to be able to pay them at your current price. So then you're going to have this huge panic and fear of, well, I need to hire people, but if I hire people, I've got to raise my prices. And if I raise my prices, I'm afraid I won't get any work. Um, it's much easier to just go for it up front and pay yourself for the job and include that in your cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is labor plus materials. And you're going to see that in stuff that we do and then in other things as COGS or COGS, cost of goods sold. So the cost of goods sold times two equals a 50% gross profit margin. Gross profit minus expenses, your light bill, your water bill, your payroll, your insurances, your trucks, whatever, maintenance, wear and tear. Once you take all that out, you are left with the, the net profit, which is usually a much smaller number. So you got to make sure you get the get your gross profit right so that you leave some meat on the bone to have net profit for your company to expand and obviously pay, pay your, uh, pay your people. So bidding platforms. So the next, the next questions that we get commonly is what are you using to bid your jobs? Um, what can you use and what do you recommend for us? We use the second one on the list. We use job Nimbus. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but here's a couple things you can use. You can use carbon copy written estimates. You can use Job Nimbus. You can use a bunch of other different bidding software that I, I don't know what they are, uh, but they're out there. You can create your own Word document, you know, and you can you can get that turned into a carbon copy estimate, or you can just do a Word document or a PDF every single time. When I was in the fence business, I did a PDF. I had a, a beautiful PDF made up, and I would add markup into it, flatten the file, and then I would send it to my customer uh, with a beautiful drawing of the job. Uh, it worked really well. I like job Nimbus now because it's faster and we can, uh, we can scale that a lot easier. And then lastly, we've sort of got a basic form of sending an estimate in the stain and seal experts app, 
I'll talk more about the app later, but the app will calculate your stain needed and then the price for the job. And you can, you can just send that over in a text message, which I really don't recommend. But if you need a placeholder or something, or maybe you say, hey, I'll send you over a written proposal later, but here it is right now in text message form. This is the price. You can do that. That's okay. That works. I'm going to take a sip of coffee here and catch my breath. And next, we're going to talk about the proposal. You must provide a written proposal to your client. If you don't, how are they going to do business with you? You always present the proposal. I don't like to leave. If I'm seeing a customer, I don't like to leave without giving them a proposal. You're there. Why wouldn't you do it? So many guys, um, they come out to see the customer. And then they say, all right, I'll get back to you. And they may run 10 estimates in a day. And they tell the customer, I'll get back to you. And then they go home and then they start stealing time from their family because they're sitting on the couch while their kids want to play and do all this until midnight. They're doing estimates that they could have done when they were there. And the quality of the estimate is not as good because it's not fresh on your mind. You've got 10 backyards in your mind and you're trying to remember the one that had all the the, the trouble areas and you just can't remember it all. So do the, if, if you're into running estimates in person, do it on the spot and get it done. Take that extra 10 minutes, create the proposal and, and propose, give the proposal to your customer, meet with them, shake their hand, look them in the eyes, give it to them and uh, try to close that business. Ask for the sale. I don't want to get too much into uh, uh, sales training, but you got to ask for it. You know, there's a story um, I've always heard of uh, somebody, I can't remember their name, but they're an insurance sales guy. And they had a friend, a lifelong friend in the that, that they were friends with. And this guy was in insurance. And he saw on Facebook that his friend just got insurance with a new company. Um, and it wasn't him. And he called his friend and said, hey, man, why didn't you use me for your insurance? And the friend said, well, you never asked me to let that sink in for a minute. Always ask for the sale. They cannot sign up, proceed, et cetera, without a written proposal. So you need to be giving these people a written proposal. They deserve it. They need to look at it and they, they want to read it. They want to look at it and flip through it. They want to hold it in their hand. You've got to present the proposal. Do not wait to send your proposal. Do it now. We live in the, I want it now age. It's just the way it is. You can order something today and have it today. So give your customer what they want, what they're used to, and, and get them, hook them up. A lot of jobs are closed simply just based on the, the fact that you answered the phone, your price fits in line with what they think it should be, and they're ready to do it. So be that guy, be there, get the job. Time equals money. Remember that. So now this is, we've gone through the basic stuff. I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to, um, I'm going to swap screen shares, and then we're, we're going to come back and we're going to go over a bunch of jobs. Um, but I'm going to show you some bidding platforms and show you a couple of tricks that we do and um, see what you think about that. And I think some of this stuff will help you. I'm going to do a new screen share here, and I'm going to move to this screen. All right. Hopefully you can see that new screen there. This is Job Nimbus. So Job Nimbus, a lot of guys ask, is that the best software out there? Probably not. It, I, I doubt that it is, but it works for us. Um, it's, I, I don't know what we're paying for it. It's probably $50 or $150 a month per user, something like that. Is it the best? Probably not. Is it worth it? Yes. Does it work? Yes. Does it do more to use it for? Absolutely. So, but the first thing you do in Job Nimbus is you're going to uh, start from scratch. You just come to this plus box. And so when somebody calls, what I like to do is just hit plus, add a contact, and let's just do a test here. We will say that uh, we're gonna do this job here for, for testing Johnson. Just call him testing Johnson. And his email address is whatever it is, info at Stain and So Experts. We'll give him a phone number of the lucky number eight, 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 eight. And his address is um, 300 West Main Street. And 
with job Nimbus, you don't have to put the city and state. You could just put the zip code in and it'll automatically fill it. So we'll just give a Nashville zip code 37115. And that's going to come up Madison, a suburb of Nashville. And the cool thing about this is if you're a, someone who answers the phone, you can just assign this to a sales rep or um, for, for this one, obviously this would be me. So I would just leave it as myself. And you can, you can go in here and you can set up who, who sent it for you. So maybe we'll say we got this one off. Our lead source was from next door. Somebody from next door called us and I can change the status of leads, inspections, follow-up, whatever. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. Um, does more, like I said, than we use it for, but there you go. And stain and seal, are we doing wood restoration, whatever, click save. So now I've created a customer um, and this customer is in job Nimbus. When I create an estimate, it will still be in job Nimbus. When I turn this estimate into approved or I turn it into a work order, then it's going to automatically sync with my QuickBooks, which is really nice because we have a bookkeeper and she will immediately get this job. It goes on the books and she's going to know, hey, we need to we need to start getting the process going for this customer. But anyways, the cool thing about Job Nimbus, I said earlier, is it allows us to scale what we're doing. Instead of me remembering all these descriptions of what things are and what they cost, Job Nimbus remembers it for us so everybody can use it. So for instance, if we have a fence job that has needs a basic wash, a fence cleaning basic wash, there it is. And let's say it's 1,200 square feet. Boom, I can put my numbers in it, um, which is really nice. If... Um, Let's, let's just say we're going to do a 400, 44, 44 square feet on that. And I'm sorry, Mom, I've got an Apple mouse that's acting crazy. But um, and then let's say that same fence is going to be um, a 72 inch tall cap and trim. Or maybe let's just say it's a whatever. So the cool thing, as you can see, we've got a lot of descriptions. All my descriptions are in here with the price for each job specifically. So let's just say 72 inch cap top fence staining. There you go. Let's say it's 4440. Boom. It's quoted. It's done. If I want to add prep work or masking, you know, I can I can add that. If I've got a pool pool masking, it's already in there. Um, and I've got one pool, so boom, it added pool masking on. Let's you know, and I know this is only fence, but let's say there's a fence or a deck. It's all in here. It's really, really, really nice to have all these descriptions and prices already in there. Um, so all I have to do is just punch the numbers in. It makes it really fast. Um, and I think most folks would agree. Another thing here um, is it makes it really fast to save the estimate. And I can add a required signer. I can just click. Uh, required signer, and I want to send that to Testing Johnson, our test subject here. Click Next, Send Request, boom, it is finished. Um, that's awesome. You can do that. You can also email the estimate a separate way. You can send it there. I sent my customer an email. And Job Nimbus is really smart because it, it keeps up with all that. And I'm sure all these other ones do as well. And just for the record, I know I sound like I'm horn the pain to deal with they don't they don't do updates fast enough for us sometimes you know there's some certain features that you would think would be on here that are not um, we're not endorsed by them we pay our bill just like everybody else does but it's just a good solid program um, and I, I recommend it um, I don't really have experience with other softwares but now I can go through and I can keep track of all my projects I can look at this I can see oh I did an estimate on this date I know um, I know everything I need to know and it, and it keeps track here as well. It shows I sent an email and it shows I sent a signature request. I'm pretty bold. When I send a quote, I'm sending a signature request because uh, I'm trying to close the business. But the next thing that's really nice about Job Nimbus is you can create, you can change the status to approved. And now it's going to go to my QuickBooks. Secondly, I can create a work order. So I can take that same, very same project, turn it into a work order. It's 4,400 square feet. So I know I'm going to use, uh, I'm just going to tell my guys to take 50 gallons of uh, cedar tone fence stain. And now, and also 
I can put notes in here uh, for my crew. So if let's say uh, pool masking travertine high dollar, you know, let's say it's a travertine pool, an Italian stone pool that costs a lot of money, put high dollar on there, pool masking. Maybe you want to put a couple stars or whatever. That's a really quick and sweet thing. So save work order. I can create invoices on here. I can do all of these things, which is really nice, but I'm moving on. Hopefully that shows you how easy it can be to bid a job. Um, hope that helps. And there you go. Another thing just before we leave work orders, got checklist and things, which is pretty cool. You can make it, you can customize all this yourself. Let's talk about another thing. A lot of you guys are too busy to run estimates all day long. I used to spend all my time running estimates and I would run 10 estimates a day, every day. And it made me sick because I just, that's all I was doing. That's all I had time to do. And our close rate wasn't really that great because we were doing the same thing every, everybody else was doing. Uh, just running around like a wild person. Um, and I didn't like it. And one day I decided I wasn't gonna run estimates anymore. Um, and a lot of people said I was crazy and I didn't care. Um, I decided I wanted my time back. I was tired of stealing time from my family. So I wanted my time back. So what did I do? I figured out a way to do it um, without going on the job site. And so what we do now is we request current photos of the backyard. Uh, we wanna see what's going on. We wanna ask lots of questions. Hey, is there anything there that I can't see? Is there any fences in your backyard Does the or decks in your backyard? decks is there any pools in your backyard is there any pools in the neighbor's backyard the same stuff we went over um, on the the things to be looking out for we're asking those questions and now we're going to use google earth so whatever the place is most places nowadays i can i can look on google earth so i can look at their pictures that they've sent me then i can go on google earth and look and i can also usually get a copy of the fence proposal where they had the fence built and with those three things i'm golden uh, the fence company he's already got on there how much fence is there so we know what the footage is i've got pictures from you and i've got a google earth reference to go off of i'm not coming out there anymore and this works really good on fence staining because it's pretty cut and dry we're going to stain the fence and we're just we, we once you've been doing this a little while you know what it takes to get a job done. So let's zoom in here and just show how accurate Google Earth can be. So let's say um, this is our customer. Right click where you wanna start, click on each corner, boom, there it is, 314 feet. I know that Google Earth is accurate within one to two feet and generally it's accurate within just a few inches. So I'm is it so is it worth doing it like this and maybe being a foot off on my measurement is that cheaper or is driving all the way across town um, to go look at this thing um, to find out that it wasn't in their budget is which one's cheaper um, so the idea is we're pre-qualifying our customers um, and we're taking it a step further with most projects because we can give them a, a complete accurate quote based on those three metrics i told you about earlier the photos the Google Earth image and the fence proposal. Well, what if um, they don't have a fence proposal and they don't know their measurement? That's okay. Google Earth will tell me what their measurement is. Well, what if it's a new neighborhood and Google Earth isn't even there yet? That's okay. Send me pictures of the backyard. If you can't do it, um, take your phone and just do a video all the way around the fence. And I can count panels. We know that most wood privacy fences are built on eight foot centers. Um, coming from the fence industry, I know it's usually just a touch shorter than that. So if you're eight, you're good. Most fences are set on seven and three quarters, 7.8 feet centers. So if you go eight feet, you're gonna, you're gonna be over just a little bit, which is okay. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can do this. You can do Zylo, you can go to Zylo.com and usually see the home listing for most new homes. And you can see the backyard, you can see what's going on on the house, you can see what the neighbor's yards look like. And in this technology age, you just don't have to drive out to see fences and backyards anymore uh, like you used to. Um, now that's not a one size fits all approach. There's still projects you need to go see, but it's a really good tool to use, especially for pre-qualification. 
uh, because sometimes you've got a $5,000 job and the customer thinks it's a $500 job and you just don't need to drive out there for that. You need to let them know up front what it's going to be roughly and then they can make their decision if they like it. Then you can come out and finalize it if you're really set on going for in-person bids. Um, so there you go. Uh, we'll just look at a couple more backyards. This is just one of the typical neighborhoods that we work in. Um, and you can see like this guy right here, this backyard, we can measure it, no problem, but we got a little problem here. Um, there's stuff right here. What is this? This is this white pea gravel that we see or river rock on this side. And on the back side, it looks like we got some of that same kind of kind of gravel that looks probably more like riprap. Maybe they got a ditch there um, over here. And so it's a 463 foot fence. This is a good job, but I want pictures of this and um, I want to know what they want us to do. Do they want us to mask this? Do they want to rake it back? Just set that standard up front with what the expectation is uh, from your customer. You'll be fine. It's easy stuff to do. Same thing. Another thing that Google Earth's really good for is let's say, let's say we're staining this fence. Let's say there's a fence right here in this backyard. Look, if the if the homeowner sends you pictures and all you can see is just the inside view of this backyard and maybe the two front sections from the road, you're gonna think, oh, this is a super easy job. There's nothing going on. There's nothing I need to worry about, but I want to I want to show you a few things that are going on here that you may not be paying attention to. Number one, pretty obvious. There's a freaking swimming pool on both sides of this. Um, I don't know about you, but if I've got a swimming pool and there's somebody in my backyard staying at the neighbor's fence, I want to make sure they're doing what's necessary to cover my pools. So you need to have that conversation with your client and say, hey, look, we're going to have to mask these pools. And we're going to have to be in the neighbor's backyard and they need to know about it. And we need to have that communication with them and their approval before we can proceed. Number two, there's a fence along the back here. Look how close that fence is. Can we get in here to stain this? That's a big question. And I just don't know um, if we can get in there or not. Um, this looks like an agricultural style fence. So you need to keep your eye out for things like that because you may not be able to get to the back side of it. Um, here's a particular example. This house right here, we stained for someone. This is our walnut stain on this house. And I know for a fact that this line right here is two fences that are literally touching. So what we had to do, they, they wanted this backyard, wanted their fence taller than the neighbor's fence, excuse me. So they could not see the neighbor's fence sticking up over the other side. So they built their fence slightly taller and we had to do the cap top on this fence without getting stain on the neighbor's fence. So again, we asked up front, hey, what's going on there? What about the shared fence section? Are we staining both sides? Are we, you know, is the neighbor okay if we're in the backyard? Things like that. And um, they told us, hey, here's the deal. There's two fences there. You can only stain one side and you can't get anything on the neighbor's fence. Roger that check what we we note made a note of that and we we knocked it out um and then that brings us to one last question who's responsible for the other side what if this is my fence um what if this is my fence right here i paid for all of this fence and i want to get both sides stained but my neighbor's a jerk and he doesn't want me in the backyard check your state laws but in tennessee we have the right to maintain our property and if there's a fence on the property line or even an inch or two inside the property line, you have the right to go into the neighbor's yard uh, within reason and, and reasonably do a reasonable job um, of staining their fence. And when I say reasonably, I mean, you can't have three trucks in the backyard and 15 guys over here hanging out in material, but you can definitely have your sprayer set up in this backyard, hoses going over the fence, and you have one or two people walking right along the fence line, spraying the fence, nothing they can do about it. Um, they can call the police and cause a scene, um, but the law is the law and they've got the right to maintain their fence. So, um, but generally that never happens. That's like a once every five years we run into a customer like that. So um, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Just remind folks that, hey, um, most likely in this state, you have the right to maintain your property. So I recommend you staying both sides of the fence. There you go. And this right here, 
confined space staining we talked about earlier. So keep an eye out for it. All right, so let's go bid a few jobs. Let's, uh, let's bid a couple of jobs. We're gonna throw these out and I'm just gonna tell you how I would bid them. And uh, you let me know your thoughts on this. All right, back to our original screen, the proposal. Again, we gotta provide a proposal. So let's start. So Mr. Customer, how about you send us a couple of pictures of the backyard and uh, let's have a look at it. So I'm not gonna show the addresses just for, for privacy reasons, but these are some real jobs that we've quoted here this week. And I just threw the pictures over here in this so you guys could see what we're doing and just give you an idea of what service we would offer and how we would bid this project. So I'm gonna blow some of these pictures up really big so you can see them. Um, no, I'm not, I'm just gonna go for it. So here's standard privacy fence. What am I noticing? I noticed that this is six foot tall. This has metal post. It's a fairly open backyard. They've got pets um, and it's brick houses. So it's gonna be a pretty easy stain job, nothing crazy going on. And this particular customer, the first thing I noticed was that these are not regular steel posts. These are Postmasters. Uh, it's shaped like a stop sign post. And what the standard procedure usually is, is to take a picket and cover that up right there. So we don't usually see exposed postmasters. So I asked the question, I said, hey, Mr. Customer, what are you, are you gonna put cover boards over those uh, posts or are those just gonna stay exposed? Because it's gonna change whether or not we have to wipe those posts down versus they're not being seen because they're covered with wood. And they said, oh, actually, we're gonna, we're gonna cover them with wood. So they said, all right, no problem. Before we get there, make sure you have that done and then we'll stain it to match. But here's a few more pictures of this backyard. So as we, as we look off the back porch, we can see that, um, that we've got some trees back here, some Leland Cypress trees that we're gonna have to mask. And you ask your customer, hey, how far off the fence are those trees? Can we walk between it? Can you take a wheelbarrow between it? Describe it. Can you do a big lawnmower? Is it touching the fence? Because that's going to change our bidding process. This particular one, there's, a, there's plenty of room to walk behind there. It's about four feet behind the fence, which is plenty of room, but we still need to take a little bit of, do a little bit of uh, uh, masking. We're not going to mask these trees, probably. We're going to play the wind in our favor, and we're probably going to hold like a four by eight sheet of board up as we're staying in the back side of that fence, have a four by eight sheet of board over each tree as we move down to block that overspray. We've got a chicken house here. We're going to have to cover that chicken house up, so keep that in mind. Um, there you go. And we're going to go back. This is 350 feet of fence. So our math for this, is if we get out our calculator, is pretty simple. I don't see any need to wash it. I don't see anything crazy going on. So 12, because this is six feet tall and both sides are six feet. So 12 times 350, it's a 4,200 square foot project. So you can add your number. We said the industry average was 58 cents, um, 58 cents, $2,436 to stain this project. Are you gonna add any extra fees for prep work or for masking? We are, we're gonna add a few bucks uh, for, a, for the stuff going on in the back. You don't have to, but we're going to because it's just going to slow us down a little bit. So that's how I would bid that project. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so here's another customer who sent us a typical um, bunch of pictures. And they, you know, this is pretty common, standing on the back deck and they just took pictures. They can make this in a video also, but we've got a six foot tall cap and trim privacy fence. Um, how do I know it's six feet tall? Well, it's got three runners. My, my customer said it was six feet tall and it looks six feet tall to me. So I'm comfortable with that. Cap and trim just means it's got the two by four cap on top, uh, which is just a trim board. You know, it looks, ties everything together nicely. And I'm double checking to make sure that it's not a board on board style, which it does not appear to be. And I don't see anything crazy going on in the backyard. It looks pretty standard. Let's move on around to the other side. So there it is. Um, the other side looks like that and looks like we're clear. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go to Google Earth to reserve their privacy here, but the fence goes up just a little bit past the front of the house, the, the back corner of the house here, about two sections. And then across the back, uh, the customer did state that it's very clear back there. There's plenty of room uh, to get back there. They cleared it all out before they built the fence. So 
193 feet of fence. So how am I going to bid this? Well, I'm going to start asking some probing questions to my customer. What color do you want this fence to be? And if they start throwing out colors like, well, we really want a natural color like cedar tone or like the light honey color or a clear, I'm going to say, all right, here's the deal. This fence needs cleaned. It's, it's getting some discoloration on it. If you put clear on it, it's gonna look just like it was wet. And you know, this fence, when it gets wet, it's gonna look a little darker. Uh, it's not gonna pop like a brand new one. So I want them to know that if they wanna go with a really light color, we need to do a wash on this fence. Um, we can clean it, we can do wood restoration, um, whatever your process may be, but you need to address that. And if they wanna do a color like chocolate brown or walnut or chestnut or even a pecan, It'll cover this up, no problem. But what we have found is most people, they, they think their fence needs cleaned. And I think it's a good idea to give them what they want. And uh, so this fence, yes, I would say it needs just a really light basic wash and then a stain. See, look at the darkness down here beside the gate. Uh, that means there's a little moisture holding in the ground down there. You need to clean that before we come out and stain it. it just makes sense. So I'm going to do a basic wash on this, give them some options on the cleaning process, and then stain it. And so it's 100 93 feet, so math on that would 193 times 12. So we've got 2,316 square feet. Um, we know that this is a brick house, so I don't have any vinyl siding or hardy board to cover up. Nothing in the neighbor's backyards, it's clear. So this is an easy job, um, so, so pretty basic. I don't really wanna add anything extra on for masking or anything like that. I'm just gonna give them a price to do a basic wash and then a stain. Uh, you know, cap and trim staining. Um, know your numbers, you know, right they're going to be. All right. Here's a big boy here. Here's 500 feet of cap and trim privacy fence. Let's take some, take a look at some pictures. First thing I'm noticing is this is an older fence. Um, it's older. It's got a little age on it. I'm going to put this fence at between two to four years old. Um, and it's hard to say, you know, just looking at pictures, it's hard to say. Let's zoom in on this line here a little bit and see what we're looking at. This one could even be five years old, possibility of it. Um, so there's dirt on the bottom of the fence, there's discoloration, there's probably some organic growth on it. And so your customer already knows this fence needs cleaned, already knows it. So what are we going to offer them? We're going to offer them probably not a basic wash. This one probably is deserving of a full restoration or at least a four-step cleaning process where we clean it and brighten it uh, and use the, some high-end chemicals to get out all that discoloration um, with as little fuzz as possible. Here's some more images of this same project. And again, we see this guy has, um, he's sprayed weed killer around the bottom of his fence, which is a good thing. He said around the telephone poles, I see it around the, the, uh, the, the guide wires and along the bottom of the fence. That's a good thing uh, for him. He doesn't have to weed eat, but it's causing splash up. So every time it rains on the dirt, it's splashing that muddy dirt up on the fence. So the pores in the wood there are very closed because they're full of mud. So you definitely got to wash it. Um, so we've decided on our cleaning and cleaning process. Um, so now let's look at the rest of the backyard and see what considerations we need to make for the stuff going on in the backyard. Overall, this job looks like a sweet job to me. Um, I don't really see anything in the backyard. Um, I know the guy really cares about his backyard because his grass is super green. He's spraying weed, you know, around the fence, keeping the fence up. Um, he's got landscaping over there up against the fence. We need to ask him how much space is between the fence and the and the uh, landscaping there, and they can provide you pictures. You can, again, refer to Google Earth for that. Uh, let's see here, lastly, how can we move this picture over so you can see? Appreciate you guys hanging out with me here. This stuff's on the fly a lot. I see a storage building and I see something over here like a water trough that they got flowers growing in. So again, we know we got some masking to do. So add your, you can either up your price per square foot or you can add masking on. And this is a 500 foot job. So it's a desirable job. It's a big fence. It's gonna use 50, 55 gallons of stain and it's gonna be a pretty good payday for whoever gets this project. It's, it's gonna definitely be a good, um, good for your business. 
Um, so, and they need it. So bid it for them, give them a price. The color recommendation, I'm going to probably recommend this customer goes with something like sable brown or chocolate brown. I think the dark browns go really good with the light colored bricks and the tans. Um, and, it, and there's a good chance that that's a bronze or a really dark chocolate brown gutter and downspout. So it works really good. That's what I would do. More considerations that I see here is we've got some a sidewalk to deal with. We've got a uh, garage door. You know, the house is connected to the garage with the fence. So just more things you got to mask. So it's going to be a little slower than your average backyard fence. But 500 feet, again, times 12 is 6,000. That's 6,000 square foot. So math is real simple on that one. 6,000 square foot times, let's just say the industry average uh, at 58 cents, that's about a $3,400, uh, 3480 on staining and uh, whatever your price is for cleaning. You know, that's kind of the middle of the road about what that, that project could be done for. 160 foot semi-private fence. So look at this one. This one's got an old stain on it. It's got some boards that have been replaced and it's right next to the driveway. It's right next to the neighbor's house and driveway and white garage door. And it's also, you can't see it here, but right on the bottom corner of this my left photo, you can see that this fence sits right on the road also. Uh, so this job's going to present a little bit of trouble in the sense that this is probably a back alley because most of the houses that have a fence coming out along the driveway like this, this is the back of the house and there's an alley and everybody, uh, everybody's, um, so, so what I'm getting at is this is usually a narrower street than typical. You can't park in a driveway because you got to keep this driveway clean. You don't really want to park right next to the fence because you want to mask this area and keep it clean. So, um, so you need to just be, be mindful of that. But this project, I'm going to recommend that if this is an oil-based stain, a penetrating oil base, we just do a basic wash on it um, and then recoat it. And, and because there's some mixed matched boards, I'm probably going to try to do a little better um, wash than normal. I would probably use sodium metasilicate on this, do a sodium metasilicate wash and put just a touch of pressure with soft wash tips to clean this one and then come back in with a similar color. Pretty simple process. But the considerations you need to be taking into mind are one, it's semi-private. There's going to be more overspray here. And you're going to have to make sure you get the edges of the boards. Um, you know, that's a lot of square footage on the edges of the boards that you need to be paying attention to and that your customer, as they walk down the fence, they're going to see those edges. So you need to get them. Penetrating oil bases do a really good job of doing that, but you got to be mindful of it. Also, it's right on the driveway. But here's one thing I noticed that's a, that's a good thing is the fence is actually on the grass, even though it's barely on the grass, it is on the grass. So that means that when we uh, stain this, any stain that runs down the fence, um, it's going to run onto the grass. So maybe a good idea to wet all of that concrete down, uh, pull some plastic over top of it, and then wet the plastic and the, the water underneath will make the concrete, the, the plastic stick to the concrete, the water on top, We'll just keep it from, from blowing up, keep it, keep it weighed down. And then you could slide some cardboard up under that section there. And you could do that whole process in about 10 minutes and, and it would make that really easy, but bidding it, you need to add on for that added man hours for that added material cost. And same thing over here. You really just, you really want to make these neighbors feel good. So you really need to talk to them and just say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to either wet this house down if there's, you know, or maybe we're going to mask it going to move your trash can, throw a drop cloth over it. We may mask your garage door there. Um, don't be alarmed, you know, get their permission and do that. And again, in the bidding stages, you need to add that cost onto it. The inside of the backyard, I'm not going to show you because I've got, I've got pictures of that somewhere, couldn't find them, but the inside of the backyard is clear. So other than that, we just got to be careful, uh, make sure we, we're careful with our overspray, what have you. Um, another thing you can do for this semi-private style is have someone hold a four by eight sheet of insulation board or um, Luon, which is underlayment for, for flooring. Put a couple of handles on it. And while you're staining on one side, you can have someone else following you with that four by eight sheet and holding it. And what you're going to get is basically um, you're going to get a barrier. So 
the stain may go through those pickets, but it's going to hit that board and it's not going to go any further. So I would recommend doing that. And again, it's just something else you need to add on to the time that it's going to take to get this job done, making your cost increased. Uh, and if your cost increases and your margin stays the same, the price of the job still increases. So keep that in mind. And let's throw something different in here. What about you guys that are maybe in the South and you've got these horse fences or farm fences, plank fences, um, they're out there. Here's 400 feet of farm fence. Um, this project is out in the country, um, but it's being developed. So we're noticing we're out in the country, we've got big lots, but we've also got these big houses coming in. And so everybody's got their own horse fence. These cities, these, the city people come to the country and this is what we get. We get all these fences with, with one fence right on top of the other uh, in alleyways that somebody has to maintain. Um, and it's not a good thing. In Tennessee, we always say that's how we know these 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 aren't country people because country people share fences because they realize that that's no man's land in between and somebody's got to maintain that. Do you want to weed eat down there every time you mow your grass? No, share the fence. But um, that's just the way it is. So, but what we have to do in the bidding process of this job, we have to pay attention to the fact that there is a confined space over here. Number one, can we get between there and stain it? And number two, um, is the person willing to pay for us to mask the entire neighbor's fence and for us to get in there in that confined space? Are they willing to pay for that extra time uh, that it's gonna take us to be there? So got some concrete here. These four rail fences, there's a little bit of overspray with those because you're blowing right through. Um, and I can see this concrete's got to be masked. I would mask it. Use, you can do the water trick, but as close as we are, we're going to be throwing stain right on top of this. So I'm going to wet this pad and pour, uh, pull plastic across it and then wet it down just so I, don't, I can forget about it. I won't have to worry about it. I also notice on the back run, there's another fence back here. If you can see where my mouse cursor is, there's a fence post. There's a fence post. There's one. So we've got another fence from across the back. So we've got a double whammy here on confined space. Um, and then let's look at this final picture right here. Um, do you think we have enough information to bid this job? I don't. And so what I did when we saw this one come through, we requested more pictures. And that's something you can definitely do. Say, hey, tell me more about this or send me another picture of that. Most people are really willing to do that. But here we go, check this out. So obviously these are cell phone pictures and you can see that is a super tight space. It can be done, but it's not going to be fun. It can be sprayed. The really hard part is going to be to mask this and still leave enough room to go through there. So what do you do? You charge more money or you just set the expectation up front that, hey, really not a whole lot we can do um, about this. Let's look at some more. All right, here's that same view. You can see tight space. What am I noticing right here in this picture? I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but there's a barn over here next to this fence and it looks like it's right up on it. And I see a truck up under there. I see that they've got some kind of car. Maybe that's a farm truck or a new truck, or maybe it's an old classic truck. But at any rate, that's a consideration. Hey, We've got to do something about that if we're going to be spraying right next to that fence. Maybe that is our customer's building. Maybe it's a neighbor's building. So either way, we got to address that. And if we're going to mask those things, we're going to have to charge for it. It's going to cost us more time and your customer wants to pay for that because they want you to do it. All right. And next, the next picture. Now I can see this is the back line. That's again, that's a tight space. It is probably 18 inches or less and it's gonna be tight. And I also noticed that that red barn is not quite as close as I thought it was. So I would still ask them maybe to move that truck, um, but I would play the wind on this. Let's say if this was a uh, east to west here um, or west to east, I would wanna make sure that the wind was coming out of the west, blowing back this way, or the wind would be Kind of quartering across this way so that it blows the wind away from this metal building worst case scenario 
you you go over there and you pull plastic across the back of this metal building and it's not not going to be a too big of a problem for you um, farm fencing i generally don't quote them by the square foot just because it's too hard to figure the square footage on these so we bid all privacy fencing by the square foot all picket fencing by the square foot four rail or horse fence or ag fence, whatever you want to call it. We just bid it by the linear foot. Um, three, four, five, six dollars a linear foot is kind of a standard rate that we see most people charging around the country that are staining fence painting. If you're painting this kind of fence, it's generally, generally a little cheaper um, because generally you can get paint a little bit cheaper than you can get stain. We'll do a whole video on fence painting. But for right now, that's pretty much it. Our project process on this one is we know it's 400 feet. So it's multiplied by 400 times our, our price, whatever that may be, three, four, five, six dollars a foot. And then we would add um, something for this masking. How much extra time is that going to take me? Um, how much extra material is that going to take me? And we just want to add that in. Maybe it's going to take, it's probably going to take a whole roll of plastic. It's probably going to take, you know, one of those four by eight boards. You could do that, but you got to do something. So figure out what you're going to do to mask this and make sure to include that in your bid. Let's move on. That's pretty much it. Um, you know, these bidding jobs, they're not that tough. You just need to pay attention to things and you need to uh, make sure you figure everything in and don't be afraid to say, hey, that's going to cost extra. We need to mask that. We need to we need to cover that up and also don't be afraid to say no if it's a project you can't take on or you think it's crazy there's nothing better than being able to say you know what that's just not in our wheelhouse um, maybe you know somebody else who can do it send them the referral and uh, go from there you know stay in with what you're comfortable with what you're good at and that is where you will thrive if you get into the crazy stuff I love the crazy stuff, but if you're not set up for that, then, then maybe it's not the best thing for you. There's a thing called opportunity cost. So for instance, if you get a $10,000 job that will take you a week to do, is that better to do or is it better? And, and then put on hold all your other projects or is it better to do um, you know, two jobs a day that are $2,000 a piece. And at the end of the week, you're at $20,000. So you spent all your resources on a 10, on $10,000 worth of work where you could have done 20 in the same amount of time. Um, that's opportunity cost. Um, so don't, don't, don't forget that number. Sometimes we get, um, we put on, you know, we get a little uh, excited over some of these big projects, uh, but usually a big project, you need to make sure you're factoring everything in and, um, just keep that in mind. Opportunity cost, very, very uh, much overlooked thing. So thank you so much, guys, for watching this. I hope this helps. Um, we're going to keep pumping these out every Thursday night. These things go. Um, so we'll probably talk about deck, uh, deck staining bidding next Thursday. So I hope you sign up for that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. If you don't know, I'm going to share with you all the details on a free app. I want you, I want you to share with you guys. And then at the very end, I'm going to hook you guys up with a special offer. So 73% um, more pigment. There's no competition. Real good stain. That's us. We're stain and seal experts. We manufacture fence and deck stains here in Nashville. And about uh, a, a good portion of our business is also being a stain contractor. I've uh, been doing it for quite some time now. And we feel like we've gotten pretty good at it. We've made a lot of mistakes on the way. And hopefully we can help you learn from our mistakes. Um, at stain and seal experts, um, we make stains that are perfect for fencing, decking, siding, and cabins. They're available in transparent, semi-transparent, semi-solid, uh, and solid colors. Our stains are both oil-based, we make water-based, and all our formulas are 50-state compliant. Um, and you can get them throughout the U.S. and Canada. Um, our stains contain 73% more pigment and 40% more oil than other stains. We provide a higher quality and lower VOC stain. We are a real good stain. You know, that sounds great. Let me break it down to you a little more. 73% more pigment. That number is actually pretty conservative. Most of our stains have anywhere from 75 to 150% more pigment than others. And if you use our stains, you'll know what I mean. Our stains are really rich. What's the number one thing that fails on most 
wood uh, stains. It's the pigment. The pigment is what's taken all the beating from the sun. So we made a stain we wanted to use and we wanted more pigment because we wanted more longevity. And we also got the benefit of that. And we also got more richness. So with more, more pigment comes more a richer looking stain. So hard to beat that. When our stain goes on there, it just really looks fantastic. And we have 40% more oil. How can you fit 40% more oil in the same stain bucket that everybody else is making? Well, it's real simple. We have less than 1% VOC in our stain. A VOC is a volatile organic compound. It causes cancer. It's a carcinogen. It destroys the atmosphere. It causes diminished lung capacity. Um, and we decided we don't want to be breathing that stuff. We don't want our customers to be smelling that in their backyard for six months after we stain the fence. They've got kids. We've got kids. Why don't we just make a stain that doesn't have that? So our stain does not have paint thinner. It does not, it's not full of spirits and solvents. Um, and the thing about those things, those are all the VOCs that are in com commonly used in oil-based and salt-based stains. And you put that on the fence, that evaporates. It is designed to evaporate. It carries the stain into the wood um, and it evaporates away. So if, if a product is 50% mineral spirits or 50% VOC, then when you spray it on a fence, 50% of all of that is going to evaporate leaving you with only 50% of what you put on the fence remaining. We don't have that, like I said. So all of the things that, you, that are on our, in, in our bucket of stain go on the fence and it stays on the fence. So if you put a 40 gallon bucket of stain on the fence, you've just put 40 gallon or 40, 40 pounds of stain on the fence. It is, it's not going anywhere. It's not gonna evaporate. Um, and our stain is carried into the wood with a deep penetrating oil. So our oils penetrate into the wood and get your stain where it needs to be. And you get a ton of extra benefit with that extra oil. You get added water proofing, you get added water shedding, you get conditioning of the wood. And because there's so much oil, it's going to soften up the wood. It's going to make it more pliable. It's going to flatten out. Like if you put it on cedar shakes that are curled up, it'll flatten them out and make them relax. You're going to have less warping and twisting. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And the best part of it is when you use our stains, they don't stink. They don't have an odor. So that's a plus. So maybe you think about staining, maybe you think about using our stain. So let's talk about this app. So for all Android users, I'm going to apologize up front. The Stain and Sew Experts app is an awesome app. Here it is on my iPhone. It is an iOS app. And this is a bidding tool. This is a stain calculating tool. And you can order your stain. You can find tips and tricks and helpful videos. And you can get on the pod, uh, not the podcast, but the Stain University Facebook group and access it right through the app. So five really great future features. And I'll tell you about it. So you've got a couple ways that you can bid your job or you can quote how much product you need. You can click on an area and you can just with your finger, you can draw trace the fence and it will tell you how much what your footage is or your square footage if you're a power wash guy it's a great square footage tool also and then you can go into stain calculator and you can use the map measurements or you can just input your own measurements and let's just say we have uh, 525 feet of fence that we want to do there's a button here for both sides um, you can add different sections so some times uh, this is, you know you may be doing both sides of this fence and only one side of the other fence or maybe you're doing a hundred feet of privacy fence and then the front yard's got a picket fence that's a different and then maybe on another side there's a three rail fence you can add those sections in so that is a really cool feature also we've got all the different styles of fence already in here so you can slide up and down, you can select your fence, board on board, cap top, regular privacy, shadow box, plank fence, farm fence, you name it. You can select the height in six inch increments. So it can go from any height uh, as short or as tall as you want it. And you can select steel post. If you're doing a fence with steel posts, you don't need as much stain. So if you click that, it's gonna reduce your stain usage just a little bit, which is really handy for you Texas and Oklahoma fence contractors who are using all steel post. Um, and the next thing, raise your hand if you've stained a fence 
that's 200 feet and it uses 20 gallons. And then you stain another 200 foot fence and it uses 15 gallons. And then you stain another 200 foot fence and it uses 22 gallons. Well, what's happening here is we're seeing the difference in age. A newer fence won't absorb as much stain as an older fence. Treated pine that's really old will typically absorb more stain than an old cedar fence. A new cedar fence will typically absorb more stain than a pine fence. So we've built all those things into the app. And so you can choose the age of your fence, you can choose the species, and all of these things go into consideration to get you a very accurate stain usage number, which is handy because a lot of times you just don't know how much stain to get. So pressure treated pine, cedar, redwood, spruce, hemlock, we've got all the regions of the world covered with species. And lastly, there's two more things that most people don't consider when they're using a stain calculator. And are you gonna brush the stain on or are you gonna spray it? Uh, Cause that's gonna make a big difference on how much stain you use. And remember earlier when I told you for every 100 feet of hose that you have on your sprayer is a gallon of stain. We didn't forget that feature. So you can go all the way up to a 300 foot hose and you can include that in there in 50 foot increments. And it will tell you exactly how much stain you use. Um, now for this project, six foot privacy fence, 525 feet. It's an older fence. We're gonna spray it and we've got a long hose. Um, it's gonna use 56.8 gallons of stain. And it tells me tip sizes to use, wood moisture content, all of those things are there to help you along the way. But here's the cool part. We have two, two more features on this app that are really cool that are gonna help you on the job site. Number one, you can buy the stain. Obviously, if you, if, you, if you want, you can buy the stain right there on the app. But here's the best part. There's a back office. If you sign up as a contractor, um, you can add all of your pricing in here. And everything, every style of fence, you can add your price per square foot. Every plank fence, you can add your price per linear foot. And it even has deck square footage, deck steps, deck railing, deck skirting, under, underpinning, uh, support post, all of the things for quoting deck stain jobs as well. You punch them in there and it's automatically a figure price for you. This particular fence is gonna use 56 gallons of stain and it's gonna come in at $4,725 and four cents according to our price book. So, and then you can text that right over to your customer which is a really, really slick tool. Um, we get a lot of feedback from this app, guys, that tell us, hey, I used to have to go home, figure all of this up, and then quote the job. And I didn't sell a lot. He said, when I got this app, I could quote right on the project, right on the job site. I could use the app to show the colors to my customer, and I could give them a price immediately and then make the deal, shake their hand, and go home with a deposit check in my hand, and the stain's already been ordered. So, it's a great app to use, and I really hope you guys try it out. We should have the iOS, uh, the iOS version, is, and we should have the, um, those other guys, those people that use the Droid phone, the Android app here by the fourth quarter of this year, so stand by for that. Um, there's a little more information on the app, just so you know. Uh, we'll move on. Um, there's our stain buckets that they look like stand by because we've got a really nice rebranding coming up that I think you guys will like. And um, at Stain and Sill Experts, we design and test our products in the real world on the same decks and fences you work on every day. Our products make a real impact with real easy application. Anybody can apply our stains. They're self-leveling. There's no back brushing. It's so easy. They provide real performance, more color, more pigment, more oil than most on the market. And it all comes together, makes a really good stain job. So guys, we really appreciate it. Check out our fence and deck stain and sealers. Check out our wood cleaners, strippers and brighteners. We've got all kinds of other supporting products that are out there. And uh, we've probably got a dealer near you if you wanna buy stain. Um, if you can't find a dealer, uh, you, you can order right online but we do ask that you support our dealers because they invested in us and we would like you to invest in them. Uh, find a dealer near you with our online dealer directory and you can buy direct right there at realgoodstain.com or you can email your orders to orders at stainandsoexperts.com or you can just call the office 785-1861 and that's a 615 area code. You've got contractor and dealer pricing available. And if you buy from us online, we ship the same day for free. So if you order stain from me at 245 
on Friday afternoon and you need it Tuesday morning, you're going to have it Tuesday morning because we're going to ship it the same day. Um, that's the way it goes. I know it's important to have stain when you need it. And that's why we do that. So anybody who wants to become a dealer, please check us out. Uh, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to get some dealers um, in your area. If not, just order right online, guys. Next, the last thing I told you is that I would share something with you, a free offer. Um, if you already know us and already been doing business with us, you may already know this, but I want you guys to go to webinar.staininguniversity.com. And I'm going to punch it in here. Um, webinar.staininguniversity.com forward slash deal. I'm going to pull that screen share up right quick. I'm going to share that. So you see what I see, webinar.com forward slash deal, and it's going to bring you right here. What I want you to do, put in your name, put in your email address, phone number, and business name, because this is for contractors only. If you don't have a business name, I'm sorry, you know, for homeowners, we'd love you to use our products, but we really support our contractors by giving them a little better pricing. And if you sign up right here, we're going to email you a promo code your own discount code that will get you 25% off all of our stains. And it's going to get you free shipping on every order you place with us. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. Your contractors means the world to us that you've, uh, you support us and look to us. And I would love it if you uh, have questions on what you're doing. If you need help, if you need tech support, call us. Our office phone number is staffed. Uh, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week, Monday through Friday. And anybody here in our office, there's 14 of us, we can all take your call and we'll help you with any staining, cleaning, restoration pro problem or project that you're working on. So we've got a great tech line here, tech department, and uh, we'd love to help. And we hope to see you on the next webinar, guys. Remember, Thursday nights, and we'll see you soon.